my name is Carrie Murray. I work with Everactive Schools and I serve as the Director of Strategy and Innovation here. Uh, I have worked for Everactive Schools for almost nine years. And before that, I worked for about six years for the um, Alberta Health Services. And I supported four school jurisdictions in Southeast Alberta. Uh, so I'm my background is health promotion. School-based health promotion is, is what I've done for most of my career. And I'm really happy to be sharing time with you all today and my colleague, Adam. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Pratt. I am a health and wellness consultant with Everactive Schools. It's a new role for me as of September. Uh, prior to that, I was a teacher. Most of my time was taught as a physical education specialist at a K-8 to school. I've also been a classroom generalist for a little bit in uh, the middle years. Uh, and yeah, that was for about seven years and now just new into this role with Everactive Schools. So looking forward to talking about some uh, cross-curricular teaching and learning today in regards to the new uh, Biz Ed and Wellness curriculum and all the other uh, subjects that you're up teaching. We're happy to bring this work to you today on behalf of the partnership between Alberta Regional Professional Development Consortia, Consortia Healthy Schools Lab, which is... Um, uh, working out of the Alberta University of Alberta and Everactive Schools. So that's where Adam and I are from. This is what we're hoping to talk about today in the session. So we're going to review the philosophy and structure of the new phys ed and wellness curriculum. We'll discuss entry points to integrating phys ed and wellness in other subject areas. And a good uh, reminder from that the we were made aware of last time, it's important to specify that today we're going to use the draft curricula um, that's published on the new Learn Alberta website. So we are looking at the draft curricula for all um, subject areas that have not yet been implemented, just because um, the, the, the creation of that cross-curricular content is really easily done in that way. So uh, you'll see that a little bit later. And then finally, we want to explore some practical applications. So we are going to quickly jump into the new curriculum and um, the framework of the new curriculum is something we wanted to highlight. Now, one thing that's really cool about this new rollout of the curriculum, again, another big positive is it's consistent. The framework is consistent across subject areas. So whether you're looking at, you know, English language arts, math, or physical education wellness right now, this framework is the same. So it makes it a little bit easier to read, especially if you are a generalist teacher teaching multiple subjects. I know when I was a generalist, I found that very difficult because you had to learn how to read each curricular document. Um, and while this might be different from curriculums you've read before, which takes some work to understand how it how it's laid out and, and wrap your head around it, at least it's consistent across subjects. So once you kind of figure out the structure, it should help you out quite a bit. Um, so as we said, organizing ideas start off each subject. So there, they say, Albert Ed says you're starting with the end in mind. These are kind of big picture ideas that kind of encompass the whole subject matter. So there's eight of them in physical education. You can read them on your screen there. But basically, these are, again, your, your big picture ideas, um, the kind of key areas that help you start, kind of wrap your head around like the outcomes and this knowledge, understanding skills and procedures that you're gonna teach within the subject, within each of these areas. Um, we can pop over to guiding questions there, Carrie. Underneath each organizing idea, there's a guiding question. So again, these are kind of like, lots of times they'd be referred to as like inquiry questions. They kind of spark interest in the organizing idea. Uh, within the subject and kind of give you a direction to go within within the organizing idea. And then underneath these guiding questions, there are learning outcomes. Uh, the learning outcome is what students are required to know, understand, and demonstrate. So typically in the school division, these learning outcomes are what you're actually responsible for assessing on. And this is going to vary from school division to school division, how you're actually um, reporting on these, but typically these learning outcomes are the piece that are pulled out that uh, you must assess and report. Now, underneath the learning outcomes is this is like the bulk of the curriculum where you're going to have the most detail, the most information, the most words. 
So your, this is your knowledge, your understanding, your skills and procedures. They're often called CUSPs, you know, in education, we love acronyms. So if you hear people talking about the CUSPs and you're like, what are you talking about? This is what they're talking about. Um, this is what a student needs to know, how to apply what they know and how to demonstrate what they know. But it's important to notice that there's certain language, like you can see on your screen here, that indicate what's a requirement and what's a suggestion. So if, if a CUSP ever says that um, the word including, like in your top example here, include muscular strength, flexibility, cardiorespiratory endurance, that means you must teach those concepts or elements of those concepts. If it uses words, for example, like such as, or for example, and then provides like a list, those are options where you can kind of have some autonomy over the direction you go. So such as home, learning, environment, community, and online, that means you can kind of use some, all, uh, one of those examples to kind of get your learning outcome met. So again, these are like little tiny hints to help you out navigating the new curriculum. So these progressions are a great jumping off point for cross-curricular teaching and learning. Um, they are considered to be kind of interwoven throughout all subject matter um, from various parts of the curriculum, various outcomes. These are kind of interwoven throughout so with the hope that if students are achieving all of the outcomes within the subjects of a specific grade, they're gonna be kind of learning these progressions as they go. So in the past, these progressions have been like our Alberta Ed competencies, our 21st century competencies, those types of things like critical thinking, collaboration, um, personal growth and development. Um, so we're gonna highlight these a bit more today but I think the biggest thing is just to keep in mind that these progressions are kind of a shared responsibility where we're hoping that numeracy, literacy, and competencies are considered by all educators and um, they give kind of like a snapshot of where we hope students are at certain ages in their educational career, like big picture ideas, big picture concepts that they should be able to do. Entry points for cross-curricular teaching and learning. So uh, with that review, that quick review done, and we'll have a chance to look a little bit more deeply at the, the progressions because they are a great entry point for cross-curricular teaching and learning. But we also want to think about why you might consider this approach, how to get started and where to look for ideas. And then uh, we do have a guideline for uh, where you might go to think about combining subject areas or just to start with. So especially relevant when you're thinking of cross-curricular teaching and learning related to those organizing ideas Adam talked about around active living and movement skill development. These are considered the physical education components of this curriculum. So especially relevant for those, we know that movement and learning are linked. So anytime that you're bringing phys ed components into your other subject areas, these um, points are helpful. So we know that um, physical activity enforces emotional um, or helps to reinforce emotional regulation and self-control. It supports problem solving, memory, attention, and focus. It helps with brain plasticity. That means that it's making the neurons stickier. So they're actually able to uh, connect and those neural connections and pathways are easily more easily formed. It supports stress management, I'm betting, Anyone can relate to that for their own experience, how movement um, assists with that. It boosts self-esteem and self-worth. And we know also from the research that it can uh, improve overall school performance and attendance. But it's not only when you're doing physical education or formal physical activity within your classroom that movement and learning are linked. It's also uh, what we call um, neat activities or uh, it's, well, it's silly, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. But what it means is um, just movement, any kind of movement. Anytime your students are out of their desks, this um, they can gain some of the benefits of, of these uh, research findings. So just to demonstrate this quickly, I'm going to have you stand up if you're able to. And I can't see that you're doing it, but I beg you to participate. So just a quick stand up. 
And the reason for that is that it's a, an easy way to show you that within seconds, so only in seconds, your heart rate increases five to 8%. That means that you've got more blood oxygen and more glucose flowing to your brain just by that really simple movement. And those are the building blocks for learning. And so thank you for taking that moment to stretch. It feels really good to get up and off my seat. Uh, you're welcome to stay standing if you like. As we go on to some of the, the other reasons to, to entertain cross-curricular teaching and learning, unrelated to movement specifically, but we know that combining subject areas and learning outcomes in this case helps to make concepts more relevant and stimulating, relating it to the lives of students or your learners. It supports differentiated teaching and learning, so it opens up possibilities for different learning styles and abilities. It increases information retention, mostly because the activities are just more, more memorable um, than some more, more um, standard or, or isolated or singular activities that you could choose. It facilitates the connections between information, so you know the, the knowledge, understanding, and skills and procedures that Adam was just talking about. It really helps the, to bring those to life and connected to a student's daily life. And then um, importantly, it supports work-life balance for teachers. I hope, I don't know if Ken's still here and listening, but at, at the last moment or at the last um, session that we did on Tuesday, he shared that by the end of his teaching career, he was basically doing five projects across uh, the year. And all of those were cross-curricular, so really rich learning. Um, and think about how much the, the planning is, is certainly robust, but it's not um, treadmill planning, treadmill assignments, where as soon as you send it out, it's coming back. So uh, it does, or it can, once you're practiced at it, support work-life balance for teachers. And lastly, but not least, it's fun. So it really can support more enjoyment, both for you as a teacher, if you especially work-life balance, again, if you can start to incorporate the things you love to do. So even some of those well-being um, ideas that you shared in the waterfall activity, if you can start to bring more of yourself and your um, wellness keepers <laughs> into your classroom, that's a, that's a good thing. So how to get started? We have three big tips. The first one is just to set a goal. It can be big or small, and it really should just meet you where you're at. So you know yourselves best, you know your learners best, and it can be as easy as, actually, it's, that's not, maybe it's not the starting point, but it could be even one class a week. Is that good? If you need to expand that out, is it one class every couple of weeks? Can you try one lesson in a term or in a semester? Does that work for you and in, in your life? That can be a really simple place to get started and start with a passion to something that you care about. Um, the second tip we have is to ask a friend. Uh, this may be less structured than you could hope for. So you may not be provided um, collaboration time within your, your school day. I'm not sure some, I hope some of you are. <laughs> and I know that preps are short and sweet and so, and few and far between as well. But if you can look within your school, so into your grade teams, maybe across disciplines, or uh, even within your specialty. So if you're a phys ed teacher, can you look to others in your same field? Or maybe can you partner with the math uh, teacher? That would be, those are all good places to start. And um, maybe just a thought is that you're very likely already doing planning. And so um, I know it's easier to do it alone, but it's, it's uh, more fun to do with a friend. And then it, it helps share the workload as well. The third tip we have is to use the progressions as a starting point. So these are, these are those pieces that Adam was just showing you. And uh, ask yourself, what hints do these literacy, literacy numeracy, and competency pro progressions provide for us? So I'm just going to jump over here yeah while you do that carry i give an example like just in case you're wondering how does that look when i was teaching phys ed for a while i was starting to get i taught it for a few years so i was starting to look for kind of different activities in my class and i guess the best way i did that was honestly just asking the grade two team well, i asked my whole school but the grade two team responded with 
that they were teaching uh, about the Inuit or they were learning about, I think, a Calvet. And I found that out. And then uh, for uh, two weeks, we did Inuit games in physical education class, something I'd never done. So it helped me learn more about their social studies curriculum. It helped them take a little bit of pressure off of what they had to teach in their classroom um, and really just made it so it was like a bit more of a cross curricular. Now, again, I wouldn't say it was like super deep, but it was a good entry point for me to start thinking in a more cross curricular lens. Thanks, Adam. I am going to zip through this section because I really want to get to some um, examples, but I did want to return us over here to the progressions. You can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, just going to return us over here to the progressions. I think I remember somebody's teaching grade four, so you can hear on the left, see on the left side of your screen. Um, uh, this is grade four, and I'm going to use a different learning outcome from what Adam did, just so that we get some variety, but hovering on the eye, maybe that's our top tip. If you come back here, uh, Adam showed you a numeracy progression for physical activity, again, a great entry point. So you don't need anybody else to start to plan a cross-curricular lesson. You can start here and do it on your own, even without the support of uh, a specialist or another teacher. Again, it's just more fun that way, but I want to point us specifically to these competency progressions and take us down to this personal growth and well-being. This uh, competency is required across all subject areas, so it is a wonderful starting point. It's the hints that are going to um, start you down the path of cross-curricular teaching and learning. And it is potentially less relevant when you're starting from phys ed and wellness to look at how does this support personal growth and well-being, that competency. But what it does do is point you in the direction when you're looking at a different subject area. Oh, my screen, it's a bit funny here. So if I close out of that and I come up here to change subjects, uh, let's say math, grade four. So now I'm looking to get some ideas for how to integrate phys ed and wellness and math. I'm going to, Adam's tip, another quick review, <laughs> just collapse all so that I can start looking at the organizing ideas. I think that patterns might be a good one to think about. And I'm going to look at sequences. Sure, let's see what they have to say. So under this learning outcome, for students in interpreting and explaining arithmetic and ge geometric sequences, I'm going to pop into that competency progression and use as a starting point, ooh, not there, use as a starting point, the personal growth and well-being. Um, but I guess this just means it's not a great, <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a great place to start. It's not impossible, but huh. it just, it just That's might. like the first one I've ever seen that doesn't have <laughs> personal growth and development as part of it. Sure enough, yeah. Um, all subject areas are required to have personal growth and well-being, but this is actually a, a great opportunity to highlight that the these competencies are curated when you get into this information screen. The competencies are curated specifically to that learning outcome. So there's, there's other opportunities within the math, math curriculum. It's just not something that they saw in this learning outcome specifically. Yes, Pat, thank you. Great idea. Students can make geometric shapes with bodies. Totally. So it's not that it doesn't exist. Uh, it's just that this might not be the, you might have to do some more thinking, a little bit of creativity there. But if we pop down, uh, let's do this one and see standards, standard units of time. Again, visiting the competency progressions and finding personal growth and well-being. Here's, a, here's some great starting points for how I can integrate physical activity with this learning outcome in math. So I know this is really quick, um, but I do want to get to a choose your own adventure activity where we can uh, go through a few ideas. So before we do that, one final rule of thumb, and you're gonna see this come up uh, as we start to get into the examples, if you're using outcome-based planning as we are, so what we did was take two outcomes and combine them to give you a grab-and-go idea and a few extension ideas. 
So if you're combining two outcomes, you might be looking at a lesson or two. Totally depends on the complexity of those learning outcomes. If you're into grade five social, as you'll see, that's those are really rigorous. And so maybe it's a little bit longer than a lesson or two. So again, it's not uh, a science, it's an art. But if you're combining three to five outcomes, that might look more like a project, an inquiry project. If you're combining six or more outcomes, this is probably closer to a unit in, in terms of volume um, of, of time. Okay, so let's uh, get into it. Pat, I don't want to pick on you, but since you were vocal in the chat, I'm going to see if you would be willing to unmute your mic and uh, serve as my volunteer in this first activity. It's really easy. All you have to do is say stop. So I'm going to click through a series of slides. And when you see one that you want to learn more about, you're going to tell me to stop. Uh, foreign art. Foreign art. Hold on, where is that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so let's get into it. In grade four, just on the left, or sorry, right hand side of your screen here, you're going to see the learning outcomes we selected. So we just went in there and thought, let's take um, the art learning outcome on the top and the phys ed learning outcome on the bottom of your screen that you see. What ideas do we have for um, for grab and go? And this, the first one is just to complete an art project. So plan and, and complete an art project. And we want to focus on three moods. So distinct scenes or moods. And we'll show you an extension for that in a second. The task is to explore how color, texture, light, uh, and perspective can convey mood. And importantly, to take time to discuss how moods relate to feelings. The feelings piece is the entry point to uh, social and emotional regulation. So this is a growth and development outcome from the phys ed and wellness curriculum. And you can spend time as a class or even in, in uh, self-reflection in identifying and naming feelings, discussing the situations or experience, um, experiences that trigger changes in how you're feeling, and then practice some self-regulation techniques. If you want to extend that a little bit, uh, you can make, you can increase the difficulty by selecting, asking students to select the same scene, but then to convey three different moods of the same scene. And then you could add music or text to the piece. So the, the idea I gave last time was if you're talking through and practicing, discovering some self-regulation techniques that work for your students, and maybe breathing is one that really works for a student, that might be the text that they're adding to their art piece. So it's breathing across the three different uh, mood scenes that they're creating. So that's a quick idea. Um, I'll pause that, here. That's oh, yeah, one's scary to point out too, like this could also be done during a phys ed class because it would be easy enough to do this same idea during dance where their students are trying to convey a narrative, which is an art outcome. So this could be done in art class, incorporating physical education and wellness, or it could be done in phys ed class, incorporating art. So again, like it's, you can view it from either perspective, right? So regardless mm -hmm. of your role. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, to know that in, you've just raised a good point, Adam, to know that in phys ed, that what the example you just gave combines movement. So either you could look at movement, skill development, or active living. It combines social emotional regulation, which is under the heading of that growth and development. So if you're a phys ed teacher and you're wondering, how do I bring the wellness component into my class? That's it. And then it also incorporates art. So that's a little bit of a trio. Okay, any comments from, from our crew? Don't feel pressured, but if you're keen to, you can unmute, share some first thoughts. How did you get that choose your own adventure screen? How did you oh. get this that matches those two areas up? I made it. So it's just, <laughs> it's just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pulling back the curtain. It's just four or how many boxes, seven boxes. And I highlighted the, so if I just click this way, I just highlighted the different color. And then I did some fancy linking. So science three, and then I just 
linked it over to another slide in my deck. It's actually seven. It's seven unique slides, and Carrie just skips back and forth, so it makes it look like it's scrambling. With that. A yeah, rolling the dice effect. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny, teachers. This is always like it's like the 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 PowerPoint tips. The <laughs> I was in a gym last night where you know other teachers were taking photos of the signs that they're using. It's so nice to see those um yeah, those kind of like uh soft infrastructure pieces of teaching be shared. Uh let's do oh, we have three minutes left. Let's do this one. Let's do this one. On the right hand side, you see the learning outcomes that we've combined. The top one is science for grade three, the bottom one phys ed. And uh, this one is a safety outcome. Actually, I this is when I was in the gym, I taught this one last night. Um, so a grab and go, so I know it works. Grab and go activity, students are working in small groups and you're going to set up a grid. Oh no, this isn't the one I was thinking of. Yeah, this was not the one I was thinking of, but uh, it was a math one, but this one's great. So uh, working in small groups, you're going to provide each group with the same equipment. It can be as simple or as complex as you want. Uh, and that's a way to, to add extension or variety. Um, you can even add elements like require them to have one simple machine within their, their game, but you're asking them to create a simple game using the equipment provided. They have to develop clear instructions uh, and provide the safety rule. So that's what, it's the step-by-step -step pieces that's reinforcing computational thinking. So it's priming students for coding actually in the science curriculum and uh, safety in the phys ed and wellness curriculum. You can make this a little longer, having students take turns to share their games and play their games. Undoubtedly, there will be questions, the what if questions, Adam calls them. <laughs> um, and then you can offer the chance for the students to revise their instructions and or safety rules based on how the game played out. So again, just highlighting something you might already do in phys ed or something you already might be doing in science where students are creating things or creating their own game, but now you're kind of hitting multiple outcomes from the same kind of lens. It just takes a little bit of that pre-planning to see how science and physical education and wellness connect. So we designed these discussion questions for a chance for, uh, as a chance for you to sort of process out loud what you just what we just talked about. And we did this through the lens of um, a learning lead or a specialist. So if you're supporting other teachers to, to consider or take up cross-curricular teaching and learning within their practice, can you see it working? Why or why not? And what further supports do you think the teachers you're working with might need? But please feel free to apply this to your own experience and your own practice, just depending on the setting that you're in. Hi, I, I just had a question regarding kind of like um, just the responsibility of the phys ed specialist and kind of what I'm just learning here or gathering is that um, the outcomes for phys ed and wellness, skill development, health and wellness, the financial literacy, um, when it comes to assessing, um, like doing summative assessments uh, at the end of the, the terms, is that something like would you, I'm assuming we'd be collaborating with the classroom teacher um, on which specific outcomes we're, we're reporting on, our teachers, like what would we be best practice like to pick different outcomes to report on each semester or uh, to keep them consistent to maybe possibly show or communicate growth? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I'm happy to take this, Carrie, if you, you can add in, but I, I so I would say, like in a perfect world, collaboration, I think would be would be best. Like if you can be reinforcing this um, in the classroom and in, in the gym, I would say that's perfect. Like I used to team teach with all the homeroom teachers as well. So we could, I could deliver, a, you know, a game that covered phys ed outcomes, but all the financial literacy outcomes. And then maybe the teacher could extend it in their classroom and assess it there. But that's not always everybody's case. Everybody's context is different. So I would say where you can collaborate on it, um, the reality is you probably might have to piece out some of those outcomes for assessment and decide like who's assessing which outcomes. And I do think your idea of 
while I would say this curriculum, like all these concepts should be revisited a lot and they're a bit more like cyclical as opposed to linear, I think picking one or two outcomes at a time in the phys ed and wellness piece, especially to focus on, um, is a, is a good idea. Like I, I would argue for me, I would choose outcomes related to like healthy relationships and probably safety for September, because I think that that sets a really good tone in your class. Um, and it's not that I'm not talking about those all year, but maybe I start with those two in September and then I revisit them in like February when I actually summatively assess them. Um, because as you know, while it would be perfect if we could summatively assess all of these constantly, that's not realistic. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I don't know. If that helps, but Yeah, that was kind of my big question, just is how other, um, you know, phys ed and wellness teachers are communicating summative assessment if they are picking, um, in, in their opinion, four or five or four key, five key outcomes in one semester, or maybe they're just picking three in one semester and then they're focusing on another three the following. And then and again, are they doing different ones? And I, it's partly because you broke up when you gave your response. So just tell me, did you say you, you would use different ones every semester or would you use the same ones and come back to them sorry i missed that yeah sorry my audio got chunky there for a sec um i would say yeah it's, it's really school by school but i would say personally i would probably pick two to focus on per month and try and revisit those two again at some point later in the year so if there's 10 outcomes in a year but two per month and do two month one, a different two month two, a different two month three, and then like repeat those five themes in the new year where you could summatively assess them. And I'm not saying that's the right way. That would be an idea of how to tackle it though. Then, has time allocation changed at all or is, um, is it the same? Unfortunately, it is the same. Okay. I, I mean, unfortunately, it's the same, but actually it's uh, it's also fortunately no different. So no, I agree. It, when I look at it, I, I do agree as well. Like I can see how um, it's just a new framework, which which is yeah, exciting. Yeah, so still, t I think it's 10% of instruction. Don't yeah. I think that's that's between health and phys ed. So it hasn't changed, which is nice to know because there were some fears that we were going to combine the curriculum and lose like the curricula between health and phys ed and lose time. And we have not. Um, so that's, I think, a blessing. Um, I will just add on to the planning, Jenny. I love your question around assessment. I have, I think Adam's suggestion would be what, what we're thinking of as best practice uh, because He's suggested that as a phys ed teacher, you're assessing all outcomes within the phys ed and wellness curriculum. That's probably a newer practice. You were probably used to not assessing the kind of um, wellness components in the past, or you may not have been responsible for health. It's different everywhere. But I like that as a best practice, thinking about over the year, assessing all 10 outcomes. Another option, and I've heard this a few times, is... <clears throat> The homeroom teacher and the phys ed specialist are uh, dividing out the outcomes that they will assess, maybe because they don't have daily phys ed. So the homeroom teacher is responsible for doing some of the more wellness components, um, the wellness related outcomes of phys ed and wellness. And the phys ed teacher is responsible for more of those active living movement skill development components. Um, so they've sort of decided you know, we'll do these, we'll do, I'll do these, you do these, and that's going to span those 10. But I'll just say, even if you're dividing assessment, uh, like especially from the summative space, if you're dividing outcomes for assessment purposes, you're very likely going to want to teach all of the concepts, just not necessarily, just making sure. sure you're sort of dividing the workload around that assessment, depending again on your context and your time with students. 